one of the things I'm really zeroing in on is this idea of the Middle Passage as the birth of mermaid species. And I call this idea the crossing merfolk. That was Jalandra Davis, professor of English at the University of California, Riverside, discussing the most personally significant area of her work, the crossing merfolk narrative, which is the notion that when slaves were brought by ship from Africa to the Americas, those who were thrown overboard became merfolk, which is a gender inclusive version of the word mermaid. In my first video on Davis, I expressed skepticism regarding the sort of scholarship that she is being paid with taxpayer dollars to engage in, and that students are receiving taxpayer-backed scholarships and loans to study with her. Something that I didn't adequately stress in the first video is that while this series centers Jalandra Davis, it is only nominally about her. The purpose of this video is to show how some humanities and social science disciplines are not serving the interests of students or society. Using Ms. Davis merely as a case study, as she is far from alone in this, nor is she in any way uniquely culpable, the problems that I'm pointing to are strong ideological skew and weak academic standards in disciplines like hers. They are a mockery of the university institution and only serve to deepen cultural divides. When it is functioning properly, the university plays a critical role in cultivating citizens that are capable of maintaining a society that is worth maintaining. People in STEM to advance our knowledge of the physical world and how to work with it, people in health-related disciplines to help us stay healthy physically and mentally, leaders to lead, teachers to teach, and wise learned people to help us live wiser, better lives in the company of others who will not always agree with us. It is these latter two sets of functions that I think humanities professors like Davis are tasked with, but that are often not living up to. As I indicated in my first video on Davis, the problem is not the study of mermaid lore. We can learn a great deal from folklore. As Jordan Peterson has shown us, studying these stories can teach us wisdom for life, help us better understand life's stages and challenges, help us better understand ourselves and others, and to see the world through new eyes. The problem is that we cannot count on universities to deal with important, contentious issues in a manner that is both rigorous and that doesn't regularly involve professors, publishers, and university administrators putting their thumb on the scale. Liberal social psychologist Jonathan Haidt has spoken and published extensively on the extreme ideological polarization that has been mushrooming in university faculties for decades. As Haidt has said, the university has had a significant leftward lean for a long time, but now, rather than simply leaning left, universities have completely fallen over. Haidt's Heterodox Academy, a nonprofit organization of academics concerned with this lack of ideological diversity, reports that according to the most comprehensive study on faculty political leanings to date, progressives outnumber conservatives 10 to 1 in the humanities and social sciences. Would this not be more than sufficient to severely compromise the objectivity and balance in scholarship and teaching? If you're on the left, would you be okay with governments subsidizing 10 to 1 ratios favoring conservative professors? But in legal proceedings, the mere appearance of such a conflict of interest would be more than enough to warrant recusal. People often correctly refer to the college community as an insular bubble an insular bubble that has a significant leftward lean. This sort of polarization and insularity can easily make a person who is significantly left of center believe that they are moderate because in their context, they are. But if they're moderate, then in their eyes, actual moderates are right-wing and actual right-wingers are Nazis. This is not healthy for any culture, let alone one that is in the throes of a toxic culture war. And this bias is demonstrably affecting scholarship. Several months ago, I spoke with liberal but anti-woke social psychologist Lee Jussum about the social psychology replication crisis, wherein it was found that all sorts of high-profile studies, including ones favoring left-of-center worldviews, were retested by people other than their original authors, with the original results not being reproduced. 
This includes research on behavioral priming, which forms part of the academic backbone underlying the implicit association test and unconscious bias training that has gained significant influence well beyond the university campus. And that's just one example. A survey within the field of social psychology in 2012 found a 14 to 1 Democrat to Republican ratio among American social psychology professors. As Justin argued, if there were more moderate and conservative social psychologists, maybe these sorts of findings regarding behavioral priming, for example, would have been scrutinized more, and psychologists wouldn't have spent decades conducting research based on false premises and teaching these falsities to thousands of students. People are much better at finding flaws in the positions of others than they are at noticing the deficits in their own positions. This is why intellectual diversity is so important. As Haidt discussed in his book The Righteous Mind, when confronted with an idea that people want to believe, they tend to ask themselves, can I believe this? Whereas when they encounter an idea that they'd rather not believe, they tend to ask themselves, must I believe this? Another thing that Lee and I speculated would be different in social psychology, were it not so exclusively left-wing, is the sort of questions that would be asked. So for example, if you're a left-leaning social psychologist studying traditional family and religious social structures, you're probably going to be more oriented towards studying their adverse effects, such as suppression of aspects of individuality. But in addition to their drawbacks and potential excesses, traditional family units and religious communities provide lifelong intersupportive community, connection to time-tested wisdom, encouragement of prosociality, and so forth. These are the sorts of positive things that a conservative or moderate social psychologist may be more likely to emphasize. And we're being done a disservice if either side of this ledger is being ignored, which it is. But how bad could the effects of ideological biases on scholarship really be? In the mid-90s, mathematician Alan Sokol had a feeling that top-tier humanities and social science journals were guided more by ideology than a commitment to what is true. So to test his hunch, he wrote an academic paper, badly, on purpose. He filled it with highfalutin academic jargon, but it was absolutely incoherent by design. However, since it pushed postmodern identity politics agendas, it was published in a top-tier journal. Twenty years later, Peter Boghossian, James Lindsay, and Helen Pluckrose pulled off a series of similar hoaxes. In barely over a year, they managed to get seven articles accepted for publication in respected humanities journals. This, by the way, is extremely prolific. Serious scholars would take several years to get this many publications. And the number actually would have been undoubtedly higher if only the hoax wasn't revealed when it was. At the time of the revelation of the hoax, they still had seven other papers under review. Not only did they intentionally make their arguments poorly, they made them deliberately hilarious. Their first successful hoax paper argued that the penis is not male but is merely a social construct. Taking it up a notch, a subsequent successful hoax paper was a direct word-for-word -word transcription of a section of Mein Kampf, but with the words Jew and German and similar replaced with words like woman and man, giving the derogatory term feminazi a whole new level of formal legitimacy. Another paper analyzed dogs humping each other at a dog park as a way of gaining insights into human rape culture and homophobia, and not only was this one published, it was actually celebrated as a case of exemplary scholarship. Another one invited male readers to remedy their transphobia by anally penetrating themselves. Published, 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 and published. Try pulling this off in a physics journal. This leads me to what set me off when I watched the University of California Riverside's promotional video on Jalandra Davis's notion of black slaves becoming mermaids. Watching the video prompted me to ask, is this another case of low quality scholarship earning publications and professorship merely because it was pushing a preferred narrative? So I read one of Davis's main papers in which she advanced the crossing merfolk narrative. Now, thankfully, it was not something that I would categorize alongside papers that were deliberate hoaxes, and it does touch on some areas of importance in ways that I think had validity. 
This, in fact, actually will be the subject of my next video, which I strongly encourage you to check out. I don't want to give a one-sided perspective on Davis, but I know that making videos too long will reduce viewership. So please come back to check out that video in order to get a more balanced perspective of the professor. To sweeten the deal, I'll let you know what she told me when I asked her if she literally believed in the Crossing Merfolk story. In serious fields, it's not enough to make a few good observations. The bar to get a paper accepted for publication is high. Editors will regularly send papers back requiring significant revisions before they are willing to consider publishing it. The ease with which I was able to dissect this paper suggests that it did not receive such scrutiny. Let's start with some admittedly somewhat petty, low-hanging fruit. Throughout my education, it has been standard practice to put quotations around words when you were referring to the word itself. So for example, back when I was a graduate student studying early linguistic development, I would sometimes say that there is nothing Apple-ish about the word Apple. Were I to put this into text, even as a high schooler, I would have been graded down for not putting quotations around the second usage of Apple. And this isn't one of those pointless textual conventions. It actually clarifies what may have otherwise been ambiguous. So it was odd for me to see a few cases in which Davis, an English professor with a master's degree in creative writing, neglected to do this. What is more, it somehow managed to go uncorrected by the journal editors. If multiple English professors are missing this oversight, what else could they be missing? Well, how about a proper understanding of how evolution works? Recall that the crossing merfolk narrative refers to the notion that black slaves thrown overboard became mermaids. Here are several relevant quotes from the paper. Referring to a book that invokes this narrative, Davis writes, the Wajinru mer people evolve from the wombs of pregnant African women who were cast overboard. Later, Davis talks of a character becoming willing to consider that a part human, part fish character's fish-like characteristics could be evolutionary adaptations to aquatic life. In another passage, Davis says that an author's fluid and playful intersection of various mermaid-related folklore characters and concepts is a blend of African-derived religion, oral culture, and evolutionary science. This is a horrible botching of evolutionary science. Organisms do not evolve, species do. And they evolve over the course of many, many generations. The more complex the change, the more generations that are required. This evolutionary story arc is the equivalent of saying that birds evolved flight after one of them was thrown off a cliff, forcing it to learn how to fly on the way down. Now, some would say that I'm taking the story too literally. This is not a biology paper. It's a paper about a protracted history of systemic, social, and environmental injustices. As such, any worthwhile criticism of this paper should be focused here, not on textual nitpicking or evolutionary pedantry. He can be pedantic. He can be pedantic. This brings me to my primary grievances with this paper and the highly skewed academic activist culture that it comes from. A term that has some negative baggage, but that I think is valid and useful, is cultural Marxism. Traditional Marxism pertains to the economic realm. Its two primary categories of people are the numerically small group of extremely powerful, privileged, and exploitative people at the top, and the numerically large but individually powerless working class. The Marxist dream is that the individually powerless proletariat develops class consciousness, unites, and takes down the bourgeoisie, thereafter replacing all extant hierarchies with a socioeconomically flattened polity of the people. Jordan Peterson correctly pointed out that this intellectual framework has been grafted from dollars to demographics. In this new Marxism, straight, white, able-bodied, cisgendered, bloody blah males are the new bourgeoisie, regardless of how many problems and disadvantages that they may have as individuals that are not represented by a prominent interest group. In this new Marxism, the goal is to create an intersexual coalition based on new identity-based class consciousness that purports to represent every other identity group in a battle against the new bourgeoisie. Part and parcel of this low-resolution, group-based intellectual framework is, through selective emphasis and omission, maximizing the apparent power, privilege, and oppressiveness of straight white men as a class and the apparent marginalization of all others. This practice is replete in Davis's paper. Let's start from the foundation and work our way out. 
Early in the paper, Davis writes, I argue that crossing merfolk narratives enhance the mermaid figure's potential to disrupt the hierarchical and ecologically disastrous category of the human. By anchoring mermaid lore within the transatlantic slave trade as it launches modernity and global racial capitalism, crossing merfolk narratives interrupt the human. In doing so, these narratives reveal the imbrication of white supremacist and environmental violence. Later, Davis cites a critical humanist who wrote, man, white, straight, male, able-bodied, propertied, rational, individual, and sovereign, is an overrepresentation of the human, the only genre within a diverse array of humans validated and entitled to power in the emerging colonial modern world, whose overrepresentation in comparison to other humans is key to all our present struggles with respect to race, class, gender, sexual orientation, ethnicity, struggles over the environment, global warming, severe climate change, the sharply unequal distribution of Earth resources. To come even close to understanding where these passages go wrong, we need to go back seven to 12,000 years, when the single most important set of events in human history since our very inception occurred. I'm talking about agricultural revolutions in the Middle East and Asia. Archaeologists estimate that mass-scale agriculture was independently discovered by a few separate Middle Eastern tribes roughly 12,000 years ago, and then again in Asia seven or 8,000 years ago. In its chapter on slavery, the Cambridge World History put forth that slavery was rare among the hunter-gatherers, sometimes found in incipient agricultural tribes, and common in societies with advanced agriculture. There is a straightforward logistical explanation for this that I will save in the interest of time, but leave a comment if you want to see it fleshed out. Endemic slavery was a byproduct of mass-scale agriculture, and mass-scale agriculture was first discovered by multiple tribes that we know were not white. While it's possible that ancient Caucasians were among the first farmers, the ancient racial Caucasian designation was not limited to our contemporary category of white people. So at the very most, only a minority of the founders of the root cause of slavery were white. As the centuries marched on, slave ownership was a multiracial practice which included but was far from limited to modern-day Caucasians. Famously, European colonizers often bought their black slaves from black slave owners. Then centuries later, those fighting to abolish slavery were majority white. Of course, none of these details are to be found in Davis's paper. There were recurrent allusions to white supremacy, of course. There were also recurrent allusions to the anthropocentric worldview that humans are uniquely special among species, that we are not like the rest of nature, that we are above nature, separate from nature, and against nature in a way that no other species is. This worldview, by the way, is the intellectual underpinning of every agricultural revolution. And it, too, was pinned on white supremacy. That white people comprised at most a minority of the early farmers, have constituted a minority of agriculturalists ever since, and that well over 99% of the world's population today depends on agriculture never made it into the paper. Colonial expansion was another recurring point of reference in the paper. Such expansion is an inevitable outcome of agriculture. Agriculture increases the food supply, which increases the number of kids that are surviving to viability, thereby increasing the tribe's population, which will necessitate the colonization of more land to live and farm upon. Despite the inevitable universality of this dynamic, the only colonizers mentioned more than zero times were white Europeans. And of course, there were talk of how the capitalist engine can and does trample the natural world and disturbs, if not destroys, simpler ways of living. Finally, she pins something on white Europeans that was actually developed by white Europeans. Of course, not denying that it absolutely has significant adverse effects, even it, that is capitalism, was actually a humanitarian improvement over its immediate predecessor, feudalism, which bore great resemblance to slavery. So, considered in context, the one thing thus far that has been accurately pinned on white Europeans of old was actually a humanitarian upgrade. What is more, capitalism was never the root cause of environmental destruction or colonialism. That crown belongs to agriculture. 
Capitalism was merely a more efficient version 2.0 that came with a mixture of serious burdens and serious benefits. And of course, this paper only talked about the burdens. There was no talk of how countries that trade together rarely go to war. No talk about how international trade helped build bridges between societies, which would lay the groundwork for immigration, tourism, cultural exchange, international collaboration in the arts, sciences, technology, as well as humanitarian causes. None of these things made the paper. In addition to being predictably one-sided on the fronts of slavery, agriculture, capitalism, and race, it is also predictably unbalanced with respect to sex and gender. One problem that Davis perceives is that the attractiveness of mermaids caters to the heterosexual male gaze, a gendered term with exclusively negative connotations, while simultaneously advancing an unattainable feminine ideal. When was the last time we saw feminist scholars like Davis complain about how superhero characters Brad Pitt, The Rock, or Jesus on the Cross set unattainable masculine standards of status, competence, courage, handsomeness, and abs. Just as competence, status, and physical prowess are great sources of power for men that have them, a woman's beauty is a great source of power to her. Yet there is positively no acknowledgement of this. Each time the strong influence that women can exert over men is referenced, it is done not in a way that acknowledges the power of women, but in a way that takes a shot at men. That women have the power to mesmerize men is not an indication of their power or magnificence, but a complaint about the male gaze. Cultural folklore warning men to not be tempted by the powerful allure of women is categorized by Davis as misogyny, yet it's perfectly fine for women to be encouraged to be careful around men, to tell them that men are dogs and that they only want one thing, that men are oppressors, and that all of society is run by men for men at the expense of women. That sort of glass completely empty messaging is absolutely fine. Now rest assured, I could go on quite a bit more, as this paper is also unbalanced on the fronts of metaphysics, epistemology, and ableism. But I think I've made my point. Sokol, Bogosian, Lindsay, and Pluckrose theorized and provided evidence that journals in activist fields care more about pushing agendas than pushing truth. This paper by Davis constitutes yet another data point. In addition to textual errors, botched evolutionary theory and historical blind spots so big you could sail a slave ship through them, this paper was as intellectually unbalanced as it gets. Like most humanities paper, it will be read by almost nobody and it'll be cited by even fewer people. Because of the incredible polarization of the fields in which this paper could conceivably be relevant, it's actually quite possible that this video will be the only thorough criticism that this paper ever receives. This paper will find itself quite at home among a sea of other papers and books that are just as biased in the exact same direction. And these books and papers will be presented to impressionable undergraduates as being legitimate university caliber scholarship. Students in ideologically captured fields in the humanities and social sciences will be presented with one-sided materials like this for four years by people that they put on pedestals, their esteemed professors. Which, by the way, is another issue. She actually got a professorship. As I've mentioned previously, I used to be a master's PhD student in cognitive science. The reason that I left was that I learned how poor the professorial job market is and how few desirable non-academic jobs there are. In my talk with Lee Jussum, who spent years as department chair for Rutgers Psychology, he advised that it is customary for the department to receive 80 to 120 applications when they advertise one tenure track professorship. Each of these applicants will have at least a PhD, many having at least one postdoctoral fellowship under their belts, yet rarely does more than one of them get the job. Several months ago, I interviewed one of my best friends, John Wilder, who was a classmate of mine at Rutgers. He stuck it out and earned master's degrees in cognitive psychology and computer science, a PhD in cognitive psychology, and then went on to complete multiple postdocs. He has seven times more publications than Davis, 42 times more citations, and the caliber of the journals in which he's being published and cited are leaps and bounds above those in which Davis has been published and cited. She got a professorship. 
Like the overwhelming majority of academic psychologists, John had to leave the field after years of unsuccessful applications for tenure track positions, which is yet another indication of the lack of standards in fields like the, one, the ones we're talking about here compared to more legitimate fields. Quick addendum, I forgot to mention that Ms. Davis also published a novel last year. In disciplines like English, published novels can be very significant. In viewing the Amazon page for her book, it looks like it has probably done better than most books posted to the site. However, this is because most authors, like most musicians, actors, athletes, and comedians, don't make it. Being the best baseball player in a town of 100,000 doesn't come close to implying that you're good enough to be in the majors, for example. Davis's book has an average star rating of 4 out of 5 stars from a total of 20 raters, and out of 16 written reviews, one was negative while the others were very positive. It's 15 others. This is absolutely a significant accomplishment that Davis should rightfully be proud of. However, Given that it appears that she has used this book to teach students, some of the purchases were compulsory. Indeed, three of the 16 written reviews were written by her students, as they indicated. What is more, with a total of only 16 review writers and 20 raters, we have to assume that, at the very least, a sizable minority of these raters and reviewers were family, friends, and or students who may have been trying to please their professor. I would make a similar prediction about purchasers of the book. The fact that the price has been slashed by 65% already is not a good indicator. Having said all this, I readily credit this book as a significant achievement for Ms. Davis, just not significant enough to justify professorship. The university, after all, is supposed to be the pinnacle of academic excellence, with professors being at the pinnacle of this pinnacle. But to be charitable, let's get back to the paper once more. I will say that it is not necessarily the job of a scholar to be balanced in every possible way in everything they write. Jalandra Davis is a black person in America. It makes sense that she'll be more tuned to issues pertaining to slavery and black American history, for example. But how one-sided can you be before it moves from being propaganda in the neutral sense to being propaganda in the decidedly negative sense? And what happens when the field is so polarized that this sort of bias is unlikely to receive pushback? This is what we're all paying for. Tax dollars are supposed to be spent in the public interest. Is it in the public interest to deepen ideological and demographic divides? To have publicly funded institutions put their thumbs on the scale of tense cultural conflicts? To subsidize students and spending prime years becoming polarized and not learning to do anything that makes their country a country more sustainable or worth sustaining? If the polarities were reversed and you're on the left, is this not something that you would be resentful of? Just some food for thought. Anyhow, come back next time for the sort of slightly good stuff.